What you're about to experience is a free, worldwide, interactive broadcast from Ontario, Canada. We broadcast live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Get your questions in. Join the community chat room at www.category5.tv or email us at live at category5.tv. And now, let's begin. Here's your host, Robbie Ferguson. Welcome to episode number 183 of Category 5 TV. Uh, it's Tuesday, March the 22nd, 2011, and uh, I guess I'm supposed to talk like that today. Why is that? It's the third annual Talk Like William Shatner. Oh, uh, you're kidding. Uh, yeah. That's a day? No, I'm serious. Aww. It's his birthday. Turns 80 today. Oh. I mean, he <laughs> turned 80 this morning. That's good. That was terrible. But everyone's supposed to talk like William ah, Shatner, that and that good. was my attempt. He doesn't get it. He's the only guy on the planet who doesn't get it. <laughs> it's been working for him. <laughs> Why would you change success? Hey, JP. Yeah. Wow, good to see everybody. Okay, what do we got going on tonight? We are, <laughs> we are going to be learning to install Firefox 4, which was just released this morning. We're going to be installing it on Ubuntu Linux. Oh, so we're going to be uh, coding that website that we've been working on over the past couple of weeks, so that's pretty exciting stuff. We'll be learning a little bit about PHP and HTML and CSS, too. Um, yeah, looking forward to it. Nice to see you. Join us in the chat room, category5.tv. And uh, we'd love to have you in our chat room there. And you can help me out if I start coughing tonight. I'll try. I'm, I'm very reliant on the cough medicine tonight, so I think I'm gonna, think I'm going to make it through. Nice to see everybody who is joining us in the chat room so far. Shatner, 80 years old. Yeah, it is pretty amazing. Cool. You know who yeah. William Shatner is? I, I have an inkling, yes. Okay. Star Trek. Yes. Yes. Good. good. <laughs> I'm moving on up in the world. Mm -hmm. That's good. James T. Kirk. The original Star Trek. Good. Kept. Yeah. <laughs> have to have been there. All right. I guess so. So we've got a lot to cover tonight. I'll uh, check out our mailbox and uh, see what's coming in there. You can email us live at category5.tv. A. Jameson, 5579, saying, I just can't talk without dramatic pauses. Someone please stop me. And it's actually <laughs> drum attic, not dramatic. There you go. Good. Yeah. Kudos to Bill Shatner. All right. To the mailbox, live at category5.tv. All right. Got one here from Kevin, who joins us from, uh, I believe, Kenya, actually. Nice to have you, uh, you joining us uh, at our website, category5.tv. Very nice. Let's see. There we go. Okay, Kevin, the question. Uh, which file do I need to edit to change the activation link sent to Joomla, uh, sent by Joomla to a new user for them to join my new website? Uh, I installed a community and a subdomain, uh, and the link sent to the new member is broken. Uh, so the subdomain folder twi uh, shows twice, resulting in a 404 error. However, if I delete an instance on the of the folder name, the link will work okay. What do I do? Sounds to me, Kevin, like um, you, what is happening there is you've got, um, when you've set up your configuration for the domain, you've put in what your website address is, which might be, um, now you're saying a subdomain. I, I think what you mean is a subfolder. So like www.mydomain.com slash Kevin's site, for example. That's more what it sounds like you're, you're uh, encountering. So then it's trying to, it's saying, okay, we're in the folder Kevin's site, so it appends Kevin's site onto the end of what you already entered, which is Kevin's site. So that's what it sounds like is happening. As far as what, uh, what files to edit, first of all, you might want to try just resolving the issue through traditional means, editing your configuration and fixing it that way. Otherwise, let's see if I can get my Joomla site up. Of course, it's, uh, it's going to matter which version of Joomla you're using. I'm using version 1.5. Uh, we won't go any any older than that, as far as uh, for demonstration. Let me uh, just log into our FTP here, and we're going to need to edit two files in order to do that. 
first of all. Okay. There we go. Okay, so I've got... Here's my Joomla folder. I'm going to go into language. Find the language that your website is set to. Mine is ENGB. Go down to component uh, user. There it is there. So ENGB.com underscore user. And edit that file. I'm using FileZilla, which allows me to edit it directly. Do a search for send underscore message. And just find a couple times. There we go. So you've got the first message is just once they've active, once they're uh, actually active. Second message is the activation email, which is probably the one that you're looking for. So hello percent s, thank you for registering at percent s. Your account is created and must be activated before you can use it to activate, so on and so forth. So scroll right to activate it. Click on the following link or copy and paste it into your browser. And then, okay, so log in to, so there's a percent %s. So that means it's being defined by the component itself. So what we need to do is we need to, we can either change the wording <laughs> there and hard set the, uh, the URL. So you could replace the percent %s with the hard set of your URL, right? Whatever it is, okay? But that could cause problems. And if you do that, you're going to have to change what is being sent because percent %s is basically like a string that's been sent to the script, to the template. So if you um, delete one of the percent %s's, then the one that's supposed to be over here is now going to be over here. It's not going to work and it's going to mess up your site, uh, or at least that email. So I'll jump back to the FTP here. I'm going to scroll way up, go into dot, 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 dot. And I'm going to go into components. And in components, you'll find com underscore user. And you'll find the controller file. We're going to edit that. So probably easiest again, just to do a search for send underscore msg. There they are. So this is where it's actually telling it to send this message. Okay. So in the language file, the language, the text is defined. However, in the controller file, it's actually configured and sent. So each one of these is percent %s. So dollar sign name, dollar sign site name, dollar sign site URL, and so on. So if you go back to your language file, it starts with name, site name. So if we go back here, look at that uh, language. Hello, percent %s. We know that the first one is going to be name, so it's going to say, hello, Krista. Thank you for registering at site name. Right, because that's what was designated in the controller. So that percent %s is going to be replaced with category 5 TV. Scroll over more. Your account is created and must be activated before you use it to activate. Click on the following link, and it gives you another percent %s. And that percent %s is giving you site URL dot index.php com user task activate. Here is where you can go. Delete, delete. So there's no more site URL. There's no more um, uh, period, because the period means also. So just like this. OK, so you're actually hard setting it and bypassing the automatic detection of your site URL from your configuration file. So if you save that file, keep a backup. Always keep a backup of your files, because you don't want to um, you don't want to accidentally break your site. Easiest way to do a backup when you're working with PHP, simply copy that entire line, comment it out with two slashes, okay, and then paste again. So now you've got a commented version of the entire message as it was, and then you can edit away on this uh, second version. And if you break it, you just recopy from up here, and you'll be good to go. Answer the question, Kevin. I hope that helps you out. And uh, yeah, do keep commented lines, backups. Don't want to break your website on you, okay? This is Category 5 Technology TV. You can email us live at category5.tv. I'm Robbie Ferguson. I'm Krista Wells. <laughs> there she is. 
So lots of exciting stuff going on tonight. I'm very excited to be getting into uh, the next step of our uh, series on web development. Uh, if you're interested in web development at all, email me your questions live at category5.tv and we'll be sure to get those uh, on the show. It's good also to, uh, to have gotten a, a Joomla question tonight, Joomla being a content management system. So that's uh, a different form of website where it's powered by a pre-designed, pre-created uh, content management system and then customized from there. So I hope that helps you, Kevin. Uh, let's see, we've got uh, more questions here. I'm going to get uh, as many questions in, and if I don't get your question in tonight, um, we'll definitely uh, try to get it in on a, a very soon future show as well. So if you send a question and I can't get you to you tonight, uh, I apologize, but we'll definitely do our best. Okay, I've got old Mr. B, uh, who joins us uh, and has emailed us uh, at live at category5.tv and asks, as you can see, uh, I've got an HP Pavilion Elite HPE Intel Core i7, so the 64-bit. Um, I'm having trouble with Ubuntu and Linux Mint uh, running on the 64-bit uh, platform. I suspect that some of the software is not quite ready. Uh, can I still run my 32-bit on my 32-bit uh, uh, distribution on my 64-bit operating system uh, or 64-bit computer? Uh, thanks from old Mr. B. And the answer to that is yes, you can. You can go backwards. You can run a 32-bit operating system even though your processor is compatible with 64. It's just the other way around. You can't go. You couldn't have 64-bit Linux running on a 32-bit platform uh, that doesn't have 64-bit extensions. The only uh, or the, your biggest disadvantages there, old Mr. B, are uh, essentially you're going to lose the ability to go beyond four gigabytes of RAM. Uh, that's a big uh, limitation if you're going to be doing anything that's going to require more than that. So, <laughs> for me, so keep that in mind. And uh, I want to uh, touch base with Hillary, who joins us tonight. Hillary, it's nice to see you. I'm Hi sorry it took everyone. so long to get to you, but uh, love Should to hear what's coming up in the newsroom. Oh, well, coming up in the newsroom. <laughs> I threw that okay. on you. How, well, how are you this week? <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. I'm much better. I sound probably a little better than last week. But I'm doing all right. Yeah, you Things were a bit stuffy. Uh, pardon? You were a bit stuffy last week, but you're sounding oh, a lot yeah. better this week. So I'm I had like the black lung and my face. It just it was just bad. Yeah. Well, it's but, nice to have you here. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And so I have lots to say about what's coming up. Dun da da da. Yesterday, Twitter celebrated its fifth birthday. Hmm. Apple has filed the most idiotic lawsuit ever. The RSA Secure ID has been compromised and its users no longer feel protected. And lastly, Firefox 4 is here and it's faster than ever. So stick around for the latest news from the Category 5 TV newsroom. Hillary, <laughs> thanks for that update. <laughs> I can't do it, but there are some. Fantastic. Kudos for trying. <laughs> That's Thanks. what they'll be saying. Dude. All right. Um, so speaking of Firefox, uh, we're going to actually install that on uh, Ubuntu Linux. Love to jump right into that. And we do have uh, very, um, you know, we're, we've got so much to cover tonight once again. So we're just going to jump right into that. Firefox, of course, was released this morning, Firefox 4. It is meant to be the ultimate, the fastest Firefox that has ever existed said to be up to six times faster than the 3.6 previous release. So that is awfully substantial. What we're going to do is we're going to use a PPA repository to install the stable edition uh, of uh, that browser. So we are going to type in this line on our terminal on Linux. Basically to get into terminal, um, we go to Applications, Accessories, Terminal. And here I am on Ubuntu. And I've got the line sudo for super user do. This is giving us access to install things or do th changes to our system because it gives us super user access. Apt key or add apt repository. So we're adding an apt repository as the command. PPA colon Mozilla team slash Firefox dash stable. That line again, sudo apt dash app or add dash apt dash repository ppa colon mozilla team slash firefox dash stable and if you're having trouble seeing that on the screen at all 
I will post that in the show notes for episode number 183 as well, and you can just copy and paste. It's then going to potentially ask you for your super user password, and I'm going to do that. It's going to grab me the key for that, uh, the GPG key to allow me to access that repository. It's added it to my apt, apt sources list, and we're ready to go. Next step, sudo apt-get update. And that is going to simply update our apt list so that we can now install things from this newly added repository. It's done. So we're going to go sudo apt-get install Firefox. There it is. One newly installed, three upgraded, nothing removed. Are we good to go? Yes. So here we go. And I should note that we are presently on Firefox 3.6.14. And that's just going through the repository there, installing the uh, needed components to run Firefox 4 on our Ubuntu computer system. Um, and super, super fast. They've done a lot of uh, changes to the interface itself. You're going to see that, uh, that it has changed substantially and doesn't uh, doesn't take a long time to install either. So what's uh, what's your browser of choice, Krista? Firefox. Firefox. Of and you're on the Mac and I running it there. Works what version great. Do you, you you're on uh, um, I guess 4 just came out today, so chances are you're on like 3.6 or Yeah, I think I have I haven't updated today, so. Yeah. Here we go. It's it's just zipping through these uh, these files, unpacking replacement Firefox. There it goes. And it's done. So now, next step is we want to actually basically uh, close down all of our running instances of Firefox. You see that uh, I do indeed have Firefox running, so I'm not going to be able to get the latest version going just yet. So what I want to do is a nice little command called kill all. Sorry, kill all. And then I'm going to go dash 9 Firefox dash bin. When I hit enter on that, there it is, kill all dash nine Firefox dash bin. I hit enter on that. And now if I go back to the other screen, you see Firefox is nowhere to be found. It's gone. The reason that I've gone with the kill all command is it basically simulates a crash on Firefox. So Firefox just closes and, and has no control over um, the fact that you just closed it doesn't prompt you for anything. The reason I do that is because it's going to save all my tabs, all my open tabs. Firefox is fantastic for that, and so uh, we're able to now, when we open it, it should, if all goes well, uh, restore our tabs right back to the place that they were. So I'm going to open Firefox using the same link that I used to use. It's going to check for new versions of my toolbars and things like that. I can go check now. I'm going to get the brand new version of the Category 5 Community Toolbar for Firefox 4. So I'll allow that to install. There we go, and finish. And now here we go. Welcome to Firefox 4. And again, I'm on Ubuntu Linux. And you'll see that my tabs that I did have open are indeed still open. So there you go. Uh, again, I will post the step-by-step uh, -step, uh, code uh, in the chat uh, in the show notes for episode number 183, and uh, I think you'll find that uh, that the browser is substantially faster. And uh, there are some cool features. I'll tell you real quick. Um, one of the things that I do like about Firefox 4, if, as you look at it, I don't know if it happens to you, but sometimes when I'm working, especially on websites, I get a lot of tabs open, and it can get really, really confusing. Or I do this. I do exactly what you see me doing there. Okay, that tab, that tab, that tab, that tab. And I actually manually pan through my tabs in order to find which tab it is that I want to be working on, right? So in Firefox 4, shift Control e is going to give us our new group of tabs. And you can actually reposition your tabs. You can actually see thumbnails of each tab. And then you can click on it, and it will zoom in just like that. It's pretty cool. Yeah, Firefox 4, of course, is compatible with Windows, Linux, and Mac. 
uh, and you can get that from getfirefox.com uh, if you're using a platform other than Linux, or you can follow this tutorial in order to get it on Ubuntu. This is Category 5 TV. Huh. Nice to have you here. Category 5.TV. You're laughing at me. With you. Okay. Laughing yes. with you. That was a laugh. <laughs> it wasn't a laugh, it was a bit of a cough. <laughs> I got the new glasses this week, and they're taking some getting used to. Kind yeah, of where the topic, whole room just pans. Yeah, with you. it's yeah. so weird. It's like <laughs> it's a different prescription, and so anytime I go, if I move my head too fast, it's like I pass out, and then I snap to again because <laughs> it's just like it's so dizzy. It's yeah. so weird. Yeah, yeah, it's like narcolepsy. I just instantly <laughs> I'm out, and then I'm back again. So it's all good. <laughs> it's kind of kind of neat. Yeah. <laughs> Neat. <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. <laughs> Great for driving. You should see if I'm driving over 80 kilometers an hour. It's just, you just pass out every, <laughs> every time you pass a tree. Good. <laughs> Not really. Can't wear them. <laughs> nice to see everyone in the chat room, and you can join us there. Uh, Category5.tv would be nice to have you join us. So tonight, um, we are going to be stepping back into our series on uh, web development. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I want to do is actually help you to be able to follow along uh, with, the, uh, with the show. If you go over to category5.tv, you can go to watch the show and features and tutorials. And within there, you're going to see our web development tutorial. Alternatively, real quick way to get there, cat5.tv slash webdev for web development. Hit enter. That's going to take you right to our web development series. And this is going to actually con contain the entire series at one point, once we're, once we're finished broadcasting it. And you'll notice that uh, we've made available these files for you in order to actually participate in the, uh, in the program, or if you want to actually give some of the things that we're demoing a try, um, you'll be able to download those files. So uh, Krista has, uh, has very graciously said that, uh, that we can use the comp.psd so feel free to download that if you'd like to take a look at uh, the file as we see it. Uh, it has been rendered, uh, the shadows have been rendered for uh, cross-compatibility with the GIMP. Uh, so it will open in both uh, Photoshop and the GIMP just fine. Um, and then we have a new file. And this is blankindex.zip, which I'm just introducing this week. I'm going to open that up. And within that file, you'll see that there's an index.php. We're going to extract that to our website folder. There we go. And now here's our website folder with our images and an index.php. Index.html, index.php, whichever it is, is basically the, the main, the first page that loads when someone goes to your website. That's like home, if you will, or it's the first if they don't type in a file name, it's going to default to, uh, in most case, uh, in most scenarios, it's going to default to an index.html, index.php, index.asp, if that's the uh, language that you're working in, things like that. So what the blank index.php is, is something that I've put together for you to simply save us time this evening, because it is basically just a template, a mock-up of a very basic um, website structure. So it contains our doc type at the top, it contains meta tags, it contains some um, robot tags for search engines, it contains an IE fix uh, for ping transparencies on anything under IE7, and then uh, all of the necessary codes in order to uh, basically create a website from this. So, so this is going to be our building block, this is going to be our, our kind of square one, and this is what we're going to build upon uh, over the next couple of shows and certainly tonight. So if you'd like to download that, um, you can feel free, cat5.tv slash webdev. So last week, you remember, Krista, we were looking at, uh, while well, we finished up slicing the site, mm -hmm. you've, got, uh, you've got the same files, and we ended up with this Polaroid file. And for me, this wound up being what I would say is too big for web, 167 kilobytes. And what did it end yeah. up for you? Mine's at 300 right now, so 300. way over. 300, so you're, yeah, you're twice as much as me. 
So what we want to do is we want to make that smaller. And as promised, I thought, you know, let's, let's actually do that. There are ping compression tools, free software that you can install on your computer. It's fantastic. Things like Trimage, T-R-I-M-A-G-E, which is compatible with Windows, Linux, and Mac. But they won't do a thing for you. Not tonight. With this particular file, the problem that we run into is that our transparencies have dropped shadows, so there's a lot of data there, right? Because see the grid pattern there? That's all transparent. But then there's a drop shadow around it, so there's an alpha, you know, different uh, blending around the edges. And then there's this big, beautiful photo in the middle that has quite a bit of detail. So in order to get that down in size, compression is just not going to do it for us. Something like trimage, let's give it a go. I'm going to open that software, which is, uh, uh, we'll post a link to download that and install it on your Linux, Windows, or Mac computer uh, in the show notes for episode number 183. So this is trimage. It's a drag and drop compression system. So my file is 167.6 kilobits, kilobytes, pardon me. Drag the file over, it says compressing. And in some cases, this may work, especially for JPEG or other lossy formats. Here we are, we've, we've discovered, I think one, one of the things that we kind of determined last week is that the GIMP tends to compress a little better than Photoshop, mm -hmm. as far as the pings go. We found that the pings were quite a bit smaller on the GIMP. Yeah, without so, losing the quality. Yeah, and you don't lose any quality because it's lossless. But I did find that, um, with that said, perhaps it's just that the GIMP is already you know, compressing them as, as well as possible. Trimage is done here, and you'll see it was only able to get another 0.4% out of that file. So essentially not enough. That file is now 166.9 kilobytes. So it gave us a little, tiny little bit in this particular mm -hmm. scenario. On your system, it might do a lot better because it's a 200K file. It might take that 200K file or 300k file and take it down to yeah, but it's not this 166. Much better than that. Yeah. yeah, but this looks like that's about as small as we can get it. So, what we can do is we can reapproach the way that we sliced this image. Originally, we said, okay, let's slice it up so that the Polaroid is just this one image. But what we know about uh, image data is if it's black and white, it's ext it's a lot smaller. So what we can see from this photo, and it doesn't have to be black and white, I'm keeping in mind I say that, but we know that because there aren't a lot of colors beyond the image itself, we can get this photo a lot smaller if we were to eliminate the photo. So what we can do, let's just see what we can, how, how small we can get this. I'm going to make a box around the photo itself. This is a, a square marquee. I'm going to copy that into my clipboard, Control C. Then my background color is white. So I'm going to go edit, fill with background color, and now I just have the Polaroid, but I have that in my clipboard, which I can then, using CSS, reposition over top. So what's going to happen is this is going to become our background. And it looks just like that. So I'm going to save that, and Krista's doing the same over on the Mac. I'm going to save that into the same folder I'm going to call this Polaroid BG for background and save that. Save it with uh, compression level 9. Now I'm going to right click and go edit, paste as new image. Pardon me, now I've got that other portion of the, uh, of the image. I'm going to go image, auto crop, and it gets rid of the white area around the edge. Now here's what we're actually accomplishing here. Um, there's Krista getting to that same point with the, with the photo. What's happening is we've effectively cut this image down to a much less intense image as far as how much image data is a part of that image. We've taken it and we've basically created this. It's really just a white image with a border. Very, very basic image data. Because it has the cool transparencies, it has to be a ping. We need that transparency in order to overlay it on top of other images. But because we have now transferred this over to another image, and this image now doesn't need a transparency, 
this part, which is what's causing the file to be so large because of the level of image data, can now be saved as a JPEG. So we're going to call this photo 1, or photo 01 I usually do, just so I can always add more photos and add a rotation or something down the road. I'm going to call that a JPEG. JPEG, of course, is a lossy file format. It's going to compress the image down to a very small file. I'm going to export in the GIMP. Um, you're going to want to, in Photoshop, do a file save for web, and that's going to give us the smaller size JPEG. Back in the GIMP, I'm going to keep it at about 85% quality because I want it to be really good, and I'm going to save that. After the news, we're going to come back, and we're going to see on the uh, Mac and on Linux with uh, Photoshop and the GIMP, respectively, uh, we're going to see what kind of difference uh, that has had on the file size of our uh, overall website. So stick around, and uh, we're going to hand things over to Hillary in the newsroom. And from the Category 5.TV newsroom, yesterday marked five years since Jack Dorsey, Twitter's co-founder, sent the first tweet, which simply said, inviting co-workers, according to Jack himself. However, Further investigation shows that around 12 minutes prior, Jack posted the words, just setting up my Twitter. So where are they now that they're five years old? On average, 140 million tweets are sent each day, which is up nearly 100 million on the amount posted on a daily basis a year ago. More than 460,000 new accounts have been added every day over the last month, and the number of mobile Twitter users has increased by 182% over the last year. However, the company has not revealed how many people actually use the service via their phones. You can wish Twitter a happy birthday with the hashtag numbers pound symbol, happy birthday Twitter. In what Tom Huerta from OSNews.com is calling an idiotic lawsuit, Apple is suing Amazon because Amazon's mobile app development program is using the phrase App Store, which Apple has trademarked. Huerta believes this is not, that this not only looks bad on Apple, but on the patent office of the USA. He states in his post, app is short for application, and a store is where you sell stuff. The fact that a trademark has been granted for something as idiotic as putting these two things in a name further illustrates the utter incompetence of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Amazon is giving little reply to the lawsuit and time will tell if the courts will uphold Apple's trademark or if Amazon will simply bow and change their naming convention to something less Apple-like. Perhaps Application Shop or Software Promenade who will make a suitable alternative. Quick. Somebody trademark that. What are your thoughts about Apple's tactics? Post your comments on this news story at newsroom.category5.tv. Users of the RSA Secure ID are in for a shock this week as their trusted two-factor uh, authentication has been compromised. In an open letter, Art Oviello, the executive chairman of RSA, made public the fact that the company has suffered a breach and data loss following an extremely sophisticated cyber attack. Caviello continues to say, while at this time we are confident that the information extracted does not enable a successful direct attack on any of our RSA Secure ID customers, this information could potentially be used to reduce the effectiveness of a current two-factor authentication authentication implementation as a part of a broader attack. According to ZDNet, security expert Dan, Dan Kaminsky says that it's not impossible that the attackers would be able to know all generated tokens at any given time and even know which organizations are using them. No further details about the incident have been revealed at this time, since the investigation is also mounted by the authorities, very unlikely by the government security uh, agencies. And lastly, Mozilla, a global nonprofit organization dedicated to making the web better, is proud to release Mozilla Firefox 4, the fastest version of Firefox today. Firefox 4 is up to six times faster than the previous release. With improved startup and page load times, speedy web app performance, and hardware accelerated graphics, Firefox is optimized for rich interactive websites. Firefox 4 has full HTML5 support, improved security features, and a new sleek interface. 
Best of all, it's available as a free download for Windows, Mac OS, X, and Linux in more than 80 languages. Firefox 4 will also be available on Android and MAMO devices very soon. You can get the full stories at category5.tv slash newsroom. The category5.tv newsroom is researched by Roy W. Nash with contributions from Gadget Wisdom Guru and our community of viewers. If you have a news story you think is worthy, on, uh, worthy of on-air mention, send us an email at newsroom at category5.tv. For the category5.tv newsroom, I'm Hillary Rumble. Yeah, thanks, Hillary. No problem. Once again, great to have you here tonight. Appreciate you being here and sharing the news with us. Thank you, my pleasure. I always love to be here when I can. Cheers. You can say hi to Hillary uh, and any of us here at Category 5 in the chat room, category5.tv. This is Category 5 Technology TV. You'll find us online at www.category5.tv. And tonight we are continuing our series on web development as we take uh, the design that Krista developed uh, back on episode number 181 and then sliced on episode number 182, and we begin coding it. Uh, at this point, we've uh, now taken that image and sliced it up a little bit further. How are things looking on the Mac? Oh, they look great on the Mac. In the file size. Oh, well. <laughs> are, you, are you ready for I'll tell you what it is on, on Linux, OK. Just based on what we covered just before the break there, uh, before uh, we did the news, 166.9 kilobytes is how large that file was. What I'm going to do is I'm going to select my new Polaroid background and the new photo. And you'll see that both of those are now selected. And the file size at the bottom, 27.4 kilobytes. Right click, see I've got both of those photos highlighted. Right click, properties, two files, 27.4K which is much more acceptable for the web. How's that look on the Mac? Um, a little higher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my Polaroid, just the picture is 147 kilobytes. Oh, Which okay. I could actually That's go in and reduce. Um, okay. But the background is 70 kilobytes. The background went down to 70. From, yeah, the whole thing together before was 299. Versus, uh, versus on the GIMP, where just the background is 7.1 kilobytes. So there is a substantial difference as far as Photoshop saving files and the GIMP saving files mm -hmm. as far as um, file size go. You'll find that if you go file save for web uh, or in your case with uh, CS4, CS5 save for web uh, and devices I think mm -hmm. it's, it's called yeah. um, that will greatly uh, decrease the file size. So what we're going to do is that's the way we're going to do it. I'm going to delete that original 166 kilobyte file we no longer need it. And there we are. So our entire website so far, all those images as they are, are only 81.6 kilobytes. It is indeed, even though we, we live in a world where high speed is, is pretty much prom prominent, it's very important to think about the speed of your websites and how quickly they load. It's very, very easy to fall into, oh, it's 166 kilobytes, just that's fine. That'll take one second to download. No big deal, mm -hmm. right? It all adds up. It's easy to fall into that, but you're right. It adds up because then the customer says, well, I also want a photo gallery. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, now the website is 600 kilobytes. Now it's all of a sudden two kilobytes on one page load, or two megabytes, I mean, uh, on one page load, and that is just excessive. And it can, one, it causes uh, you to be using a lot of bandwidth unnecessarily uh, as far as the server goes. Um, two, it can cause um, people's browsers to cache things in such a way that um, you don't. Uh, if you make changes to files, they may not see those changes um, without having to re-download the website. So it can cause all kinds of issues, but really it's about uh, having super, super speedy websites. That's what we're all going for. And uh, so let's take it to the next level. I've got this index.php, which again, I've downloaded from cat5.tv slash web dev. I'm going to open that file. Uh, for me on Linux, I'm going to open it just by clicking on display. That's going to bring it up in gedit. First thing I want to do, because this is the first time I've ever edited PHP files on my gedit, I'm going to go view, highlight mode, scripts, PHP. It's already selected in my case. There we go. 
And now let's configure gedit for PHP development. Go into Edit, Preferences. This is on Linux. Make sure Enable Text Wrapping is disabled. You don't want your lines to be split. Display line numbers. By default, they may be off. By turning them on, it gives you a reference point on the left-hand column there. Highlight current line. Some people may like that. Where your cursor is gets highlighted. I personally don't. Display right margin, don't need that. Highlight matching bracket. That by default is turned off, I believe. It's a brilliant feature, which basically is going to allow you to do things like, in PHP, Now, you'll see if I click on this bracket here, the end bracket is highlighted so that I know that that's the bracket. Because what happens when you get into nested if statements, nested um, for each loops and things like that, which you'll learn about, um, is that it can be hard to keep track of um, which is your opening and closing bra uh, brace. And also that's where indentation comes in. Indentation meaning the way that I've structured the file so that the title is a part of the head element, and so therefore it's indented. Sometimes I'll indent things just for the sake of se uh, separating it out. Logically, there's no reason that the JavaScript should be indented from the head. However, it makes it stand out as this is strictly the JavaScript, and there's the end of the script there. So then the head ends, and the body begins. In the body, again, we're going to indent two spaces or whatever. Indentation, like um, being able to highlight our, uh, our braces, is, is going to allow us to see visually where a site starts, where it ends. This file is set up to load a style.c, <coughs> pardon me, style.css. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new file immediately and save it into that folder and call it style. Dot CSS. This is our style sheet for the uh, the file. We're going to start with body. This is the body tag of our website. Background, and we're going to set a color. So we need to get that color. I've set it to black. We need to get that from the GIMP. So bring up our images. We're going to grab that body BG. That was that great big tall thing that we created the other last week. And there it is. We're going to zoom way in. And we're going to get... <coughs> pardon me. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. We're going to get that very, very bottom color. I'm a trooper, all right? <laughs> I am a trooper. It's funny because it's not happening to me. That's yes. why. Hilarious. <laughs> I should cough a little I more in so. your direction. <laughs> and next week, we'll see. <laughs> okay. So I've clicked the Doppler tool selected the bottom color. See how I've scrolled way, way down. Okay. And Krista's following along as well on the Mac, doing the exact same thing in Photoshop. I've got that color. And there it is. 800,000. I'm going to copy that to my clipboard. That is the HTML notation, aka hexadecimal reference for that color. So now, if I paste that in, remember that you have to have the pound to specify that this is the hexadecimal color and then a semicolon to end off the statement. Save that style sheet, go back to my index, and you'll see style.css is actually being loaded by this. So even as it is, let's get connected to our FTP and get this uploaded. And you can see this in real time if you're watching the show live. Head over to demo.cat5.tv. And there's a folder called 001. So now, with FileZilla, I'm going to upload my <coughs> images, index, and style.css. Now those are all up on the server. So now if I go to demo.cat5.tv, there's a folder called 001, and you'll notice that the color is that rich ruby red. So now, FileZilla gives us a really cool thing. Um, which is to right-click and go view or edit. And that would allow us to edit right, <coughs> right within our browser, or right within um, FileZilla through gedit. So every time you save, it automatically uploads. It's brilliant. 
in this case, because we've got a local copy, um, we're going to edit locally and then upload every change. Zoom in on our uh, style.css. We're going to go back to our images folder and we're going to copy the file bodybg. In Linux, that's what we're going to do. In Mac, you're going to have to type images uh, slash. Like, actually type it differently. Because what happens here in, in Linux is when I paste, it actually gives me the file location. So it's really, really handy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to append to background. I'm going to go URL like that. Okay. And I'm going to paste in the file reference. I'm going to get rid of the file location so it's relative to the index.php. Relative to means it is right there, slash images, slash body bg, dot jpg. Okay? Now we need to tell it how we want it to repeat. We want it to repeat on the horizontal axis because this is that great big tall thing. We want it to loop across the site but not down. So we've got repeat dash x. Of course, repeat dash y would be um, vertical. And just leaving it off, we'll make it repeat both. And we're going to go top so that it automatically puts it right at the top and it doesn't center that background image. So now we've told it the background for body. This is our first CSS file ever. So body element, that's basically our website. The background is going to be this image. Okay. It's going to be repeated on the x-axis. It's going to be aligned to the top of the site. And where it extends, where the site extends beyond the image, it's going to be that color. So I'm going to save that file. I'm going to upload style.css to my FTP server. Refresh. And you'll see that I have that gradient up at the top of the page that uh, wasn't there before. This is Category 5 TV. You'll find us online at www.category5.tv. And tonight we are coding our very first website. There we go. Okay, so that's our background as it is. And let's take a look at that comp.psd once again, just to refresh our memory as to how this thing is going to be laid out. We've got these elements, our logo, a menu, the uh, wood grain with some text and things floating above it. So pretty simple as far as how we want to position things. We can probably go with absolute positioning, which means the top of the page becomes the positioning anchor for everything that is below that uh, the top. So you'll understand that in a little bit, uh, probably next show. So Aspire logo, we need to find out where we want to put that, but essentially what we're going to do, first of all, so now we're going to create our first div. We're going to call it ID equals wrapper. And that wrapper is going to help us to control uh, elements that are within our website so that they don't fall with that, like they don't go outside of this wrapper. We're going to go back to our style sheet because we've created an ID called wrapper. So we're going to say and just to test, I'm going to create my wrapper as background black. And we're just going to see what this looks like. Height 100 picks with 100 picks. So it's going to be a, a black square if all goes well. Save both files and re-upload. We're only uploading the files that we've changed. There we go. Now we have our black box. Okay, So that is our first div. It's obviously not what we're going for. We just wanted to test because we're just learning uh, what, it, what it's like to create a div and, and stylize it at a background. One of the things, uh, going back to our edit preferences in gedit, notice I'm just using a text editor. Uh, one of the uh, next things we want to do, enable automatic indentation. Okay, And we can also change the fonts and colors. Usually I work with Oblivion. It's a little bit more hacker-esque. <laughs> so we can do that if we like. For now, we can just use the traditional color scheme. What the automatic indentation does is you'll notice that these ones ended up two spaces back. If I were to have automatic indentation on, I hit enter, and it's automatically there. See that? 
very nice feature of gedit. So there's our wrapper. What we're going to do is we're going to change this. We're going to go height 500 pics, width. Uh, we need to know the width of the actual website. So we're going to go back to our mock-up, the comp. And we're going to grab from, well, you know what? The width is actually going to be that wood grain because the wood grain extends the entire width of mm -hmm. the page. So we want it to match because we don't want to have any elements that are breaking the flow of the website. So I'm going to go back to my images folder here, open my wood grain. You'll see that's 951 pixels. Okay, there's nothing else extending. I'm a little bit silly this way, and Krista knows this about me. 951 pixels. I'm going to actually bring that up in the GIMP, and I'm going to right-click and go Image, Canvas Size, uncheck the um, link here, and change it to 951. I'm actually just going to slice off one pixel, because I'd rather do that than to have a website that's off by one pixel just for the sake of when I copied it, it was off by one pixel. So I'm going to resave that image. I know I'm silly that <laughs> way. I just like things to be uniform, right? So when I'm typing, it's 950 perfect. pixels. Yep. 950. It's one pixel off. So <laughs> now that image is 950. So we're going to create this website at 950 pixels width. Remember, wrapper is basically going to become our website, the, the frame of our website. I'm going to throw a red border on that just so that we can see if we've been successful. Uploading it again and refreshing, and you can refresh along with us at demo.cat5.tv slash 001. And refresh, and you'll see there is a red border that is 950 pixels even and 500 pixels, uh, 500 pixels high. So that's exactly what we were going for. It's working. So next step is to center the website. We want it to be centered on the page itself. So I'm going to leave the border going, because that border is going to help us with something. I'm going to show you in just a few minutes. Go back to our wrapper in the CSS, and we're going to go margin 0 auto. Now that's a little bit advanced. What I'm actually doing there is I'm saying, this is what I'm actually saying. Margin left, uh, pardon me, margin left auto, margin right auto. Okay, so that's this statement right here. But then the zero represents margin top zero, margin bottom zero. So this statement here is saying the exact same thing as all four lines of these combined. So what I've done is I've streamlined it, made it a lot smaller, and again that's going to create a smaller CSS file it's going to be a faster load time for our website, especially when this file gets large. So now what's going to happen is I'm going to save that, zoom out, save, re-upload my site, and go back here and refresh. And you'll see that that box has now become centered within the website. There's an equal amount of space at the left as there is on the right to that red frame. I was talking about leaving this border here because there's something we need to do. We need to get rid of this little bit of space that's there that we have no control over. That little bit of space is being created by the user's browser. So it's not uniform. It's not something that we have actually specified. I'm going to go back to the body element here, and we're going to remove all margins. We're going to remove all padding. That's the body element. So now, because remember, the wrapper is within the body. We learned that when we were looking at uh, indentation. I've uploaded that. Now if I scroll in and refresh, that border is still there, but it's actually very, very close, touching, absolutely touching the frame of the browser. So now next week when we come back, we're going to be looking at actually positioning the elements within that wrapper. We're going to be able to place the logo, and because it's right up to the top, we're going to be able to position that exactly to the mock-up so that everything looks exactly the way Krista intended it. Uh, to look with the uh, with the site itself when she presented the mock-up. Perfect. So that's demo.cat5.tv slash 001 in order to take a look at where we're at uh, so far this week. And of course that will be changing over the, the course of this uh, demonstration and, and this uh, tutorial lesson. Uh, but you can also, <laughs> pardon me, follow along um, at uh, cat5.tv slash web dev. 
we'd love to have you uh, follow along and let us know what you've learned. Cool. I'm going to hop over to the chat room at category5.tv. Only got a couple of minutes left, so just wanted to say hey and see how everyone's doing. If you have any questions for me right off the top, um, happy to answer them for you, um, in particular with regards to the feature. Hey, John. Mathman, <laughs> Cool M, Agamotto, Das Auto, Greg in Texas, nice to see us. Lots of people active in the chat room tonight. Uh, let's see. Cool. Category 5 is a free service. You can get your questions in through the week live at category5.tv. Happy to uh, uh, do what we can to help you with your tech woes or even just uh, provide tutorials or show you how to uh, how to do things. Uh, we'd be happy to do that. Uh, tonight we're using Linux to develop a website and Krista's over on uh, on the Mac platform. Are you following along with the text uh, aspect of things uh, as well? So far. Yeah? yeah. What, uh, what text editor are you using? Uh, just Dreamweaver. Oh, Dreamweaver. Okay, yeah. so Dreamweaver actually is a commercial application, but if, do you still have it up? No. No? Okay. It, it does the similar kind of thing where it's going to uh, colorize, which is very helpful. Sounds all fancy and stuff, but colorization on your file is actually very important. Uh, oh, that's my computer. There we are. <laughs> so there it is on Krista's system. Very, very similar as far as how that works. Um, and what we'll do, um, there are so many different editors that you can use, uh, whether you're on Windows, Linux, Mac, um, doesn't matter. Um, we'll be able to find something for you that is going to give you a very similar uh, feature set. Um, I'm trying to think of the one that I use on, on Windows, but I don't use it much because I don't use Windows much. But when I do need to, there are there is a good one that I would recommend. So what I'll do is maybe make a note of that this week and uh, provide that for you on next week's show. Um, so uh, if you're on Windows platform, don't despair. You don't need to use Notepad because <laughs> that's terrible. Uh, let's see if I can find anything for you. It's just the name has escaped me. <laughs> yeah, I'll get it for next week for you. Any other questions in the chat room? Nice to see you. Get your Firefox 4 installed if you're using... Uh, Linux tonight. You can get that in. It's fantastic. Das Auto, you can uh, catch the show at cat5.tv slash webdev after the fact uh, if you want to follow along with our web development uh, tutorials. Uh, we're teaching you how to build a website from scratch right from the design phase all the way through to uh, programming and actually getting it online, submitted to search engines, everything. Uh, Domsnet is recommending Notepad++. It's not the one that I have in mind, um, but uh, certainly that's one of them that has PHP uh, functions as well. Doing a couple quick searches, but because it slipped my mind, <laughs> figures, eh? Wait, I think it's coming back. <laughs> with, with 30 seconds left of the show. Uh, I will get it for you. I promise. That's not it? <laughs> no? The website that I found for it is, I don't think, is the one that I'm looking for. So we'll, uh, we'll get that for you. Domsnet says too. NetBeans. NetBeans is a good one as well. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, like a full IDE. Um, so you can check that out. But there are many, many ones. So uh, uh, by the end of this, it's going to be a whole repository at cat5.tv slash webdev. Um, any suggestions that you have, email us live at category5.tv, and we will get those uh, as in as a part of the tutorial as well. Um, so thanks. I hope you're having fun. And I uh, can't wait to see you next week. And uh, nice having you here again, Krista. Oh, Thanks for joining us. good to be us. here again. And yeah. uh, we'll see you next Tuesday night. See ya. Bye-bye.